join me in giving a very warm welcome to Professor Fulker Berkan. Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to Columbia campus. And actually, I should like to say, first of all, that I'm delighted that this has taken place because, as you just heard, Mark and I have been in touch for many, many years. And uh, in fact, when he studied here, he wrote his senior thesis, if I remember correctly, on jazz in Paris in the interwar period. And that's also one topic that I will be talking about because, you know, jazz and rock and roll and all this is also very important as a, an aspect of cultural diplomacy, I suppose, the way at least I would like to uh, explain it. But let me just briefly say something about the program because there is a lunch break and you'll probably be hungry and I will be happy to take you to one or two places down Amsterdam Avenue. So at the end of it, if we just could assemble outside and I'll take you, it's a self-service place so it's not very expensive and they have sandwiches and everything and I hope they have enough space but there is a cafe right next to it so I hope we can accommodate all of you. And then after the lunch break, of course, there are two more lectures. And I would be very happy then at the very end of this day to show you around the campus a little bit because this is a very interesting campus when the European model still came to this country of higher education. You've seen the Greek columns on College Walk, etc. And now, of course, we constantly have European presidents of universities coming to this campus and other American campuses saying, well, how did you build this university? And therefore, it's this transatlantic transfer of ideas about higher education that you have uh, symbolized, embodied in this institution, actually. So I'll be very happy to show you around the campus at the end of the day, depending on whenever we finish. However, I'm supposed to give this lecture and then later on also introduce the other speakers as they are coming here. Uh, but um, then uh, at the very end of the day, well, I'll, we'll take you back to the subway station. I don't know where you are all staying, but uh, this is, of course, a very chaotic day. I don't think it's ever happened to Manhattan that both the UN General Assembly was taking place with all these uh, prime ministers, etc., flying in, and on top of it, the Pope, who is not only um, visiting the UN, but also going to Harlem and to uh, the memorial in downtown, and then, moreover, he has a big tour through Central Park, where tens of thousands of New Yorkers and other uh, people will be cheering him. So, uh, it's a challenging day for you, but I hope you will find your way at the end of this day, and then you still have the weekend. Now, my topic, as you just heard, is um, cultural diplomacy, past, present, and future. And, of course, uh, I wanted to start here with a person uh, on whom I actually wrote uh, in this one title. Uh, he is somehow the embodiment, perhaps, of what I will be talking about. I was asked years ago, and his name was Shepard Stone, an American, um, whether I wanted to write a biography of him. And I then looked at his papers and there just wasn't enough material for a biography, which as you probably know is a very difficult genre. Nowadays you don't just talk about the politics of the person, but you have to worm your way into his mind and also his personal life. You have to let it all hang out and there wasn't enough material for this kind of biography. But I then used him as a window to a world within which he operated. And his biography is very interesting. He was of Lithuanian Jewish parentage. His family came to the United States in the late 19th century when you had these terrible pogroms in Russia. And many people, of course, came to this country at the time. They settled in Nashua, New Hampshire. And uh, as is so typical, his father then ultimately started with a small retailing shop but ultimately had a department store. And since Shep was the bright young boy in the family, he was actually accepted to Dartmouth College, which in those days, in the 1920s, was quite an achievement because, first of all, 
this was the college where the elites of New Hampshire sent their, their boys, it was a pure boys school, uh, and of course there was still anti-Semitism in American universities, so to be admitted to Dartmouth was quite an achievement. He then graduated in 1929 and had a professor who said to him, young man, don't go to Harvard Law School or something like this, go to Berlin. This 1929, this is where the action is going to be. And he plucked up all his courage, like you presumably also do when you travel around the world, and he went to Berlin and was picked up by a German professor who had been an exchange professor in Chicago, and in those days you could start a doctorate without doing a lot of coursework as long as a professor simply said, yes, uh, here's a topic, you start it. And he got his doctorate in Berlin just before the Nazis came to power. And then he came back to this country and was, of course, the expert on Germany because in those days America was very isolationist. They didn't know a lot about the world and certainly very little about the Nazis. And therefore, he joined the New York Times and became an editor, ultimately, at the New York Times and wrote about what was going on in Germany at the time. Then he signed up for the war when the war started in 1941 in this country, and in 1945, because he knew fluent German, became an expert who was put in charge of a particular region in the American zone of occupation uh, to organize the press in that part. And he became rather disgruntled with the much more punitive approach that some of his colleagues took to, um, uh, to the reorganization of the press and therefore resigned and came back to this country, joined the New York Times again. And then in 1949, it was John McCloy who became the US High Commissioner in Germany and was looking for a young man who was an expert on Germany and could handle the German press because McCloy didn't know very much about Germany. And so Shep Stone went in 1949 to Frankfurt, where the Americans had their headquarters, and he for two years handled the press relations. And then when McCloy became a trustee of the um, Ford Foundation here in this town in 1952, he took Shep Stone with him and they together organized the European program of the Ford Foundation because in the meantime, the Ford Foundation had become the wealthiest, most powerful philanthropic organization in the world. They had inherited a lot of money from Henry Ford. They were the Gates Foundations of those early days. So they had millions of money to spend and developed a European program which reached out on the one hand across the Iron Curtain in Europe, trying to organize exchange programs and sending books to sociologists in Poland, but at the same time also to, uh, to make connections with West European intellectuals. And the Americans became very worried at the time about European anti-Americanism. And it was not so much a political or cultural uh, or economic anti-Americanism because there the Europeans in those days more or less accepted that the Americans were the elephant in the room and they needed the Americans for reconstruction. But when it came, came to cultural diplomacy, uh, the Europeans were rather arrogant and said, oh, you Americans, you are just producing trashy, primitive culture, our culture, classical music, etc., is still much superior. And this angered not just um, American intellectuals, but also the um, Ford Foundation people. And they said, we must do something to counter this anti-Americanism. And so they decided to develop a program uh, across the Atlantic, uh, supporting uh, journals, for example, supporting also uh, exchange programs and so on. So that is the background uh, to what Shep Stone was doing and ultimately he ended up as the first director of the Aspen Institute, not in Colorado, which is this famous meeting place, as you probably know, uh, since the 1960s, I believe, but in Berlin, 
And in Berlin, there is still an Aspen Institute which organizes um, uh, programs and is a little bit of a competitor, I think, to the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. Okay. Not at all. Okay. Well, um, so let me now move on and do a little bit of history because, we, because I'm a historian. As you know, diplomacy is a very old craft, if you like, and uh, there have been negotiations not just between nation states once the nation state emerged in Europe in the 16th, 17th centuries, but also uh, empires, there was always diplomatic exchange and negotiation. And therefore, was, there was always also the projection of power, military, but diplomatic, political power, in an attempt also to resolve conflicts and to uh, negotiate and uh, to some extent also to wage wars. But increasingly, therefore, in the 20th century, as you know, embassies not only had traditional diplomats, members of uh, the State Department, but also commercial um, attaches, and then increasingly also cultural attaches. And as a result of this, I think there was a growing interest in the cultural projection of a particular country into another society that was represented uh, uh, by the embassy concerned. But now I would like to introduce, uh, perhaps also for discussion, I fear though that there may not be enough time for a long discussion, um, a definition of culture that I think is very important for an understanding of the kinds of uh, activities you've been involved in. Because there is a classical uh, um, definition of culture which in a European context looks at uh, classical music, uh, high art, um, you know, the kind of activities that elite, cultural activities that elite groups are involved in. Uh, but there's also popular culture, of course. And popular culture has, of course, always existed also in the past because ordinary people in villages, in towns, etc., had their vaudeville, they had their fairs, they always had cultural activities also. But the trouble was that the people who defined culture were only interested in high culture and said, well, what the ordinary people at the grassroots level of society are doing is not really a cultural activity that we appreciate because they only produce um, sort of popular music and popular culture. And what happened now is that um, the United States had, of course, a much broader definition of culture for a long time before the Europeans uh, were slowly persuaded that culture is perhaps a much more comprehensive notion, that you should also include popular culture. And that is now where the Americans in the post-war period wielded an increasing influence because it was not so much high culture that they exported to Europe. In fact, avant-garde painting, just to give an example of high culture, that was then presented to the Europeans and Jackson Pollock in the 1950s was an avant-garde high culture painter, if you like, avant-garde painter. And when he was received in Europe, uh, people sort of disdained these huge canvases, which, as you may know from the Museum of Modern Art or so, were really totally unstructured and people rejected that kind of American art. And that is where the Ford Foundation and others came in and said, well, we must persuade European intellectuals and cultural educated people that this is also the avant-garde, and the avant-garde is not just in Paris or in, in Düsseldorf or wherever in, in Europe. Um, and as a result of this, I think increasingly you had a democratization of the concept of culture, partly also because um, societies began to democratize themselves and there was a much greater participation of individuals, of ordinary people, also in politics, 
and so on. So as a result of this, the definition changed and it was accelerated. One should never forget the sort of non-American aspect of the uh, projection of culture into other societies. But the Soviet Union in the 1920s already began to advertise proletarian culture, of course, to the working classes of Europe in particular that were communists. And then the fascists in the 1930s also came along and said, well, we must also project our ideology and our ideas into other societies. And the Nazis, as you may know, became particularly active in Latin America, uh, where you had some fascist movements also. And as a result of this, the Nazis started this in the 1930s. Then the Second World War came. And of course, fascism disappeared, let's hope forever. But at any rate, uh, there was the Cold War and the Soviets began to project their society and their, also their culture into Western Europe and so did the Americans. But what they now emphasize is of course this more comprehensive understanding of culture that came really in some ways almost automatically because many of the big American corporations began to uh, including Hollywood film studios began to project their images of modern culture into Europe. And you probably know that already in the 1920s, but certainly by the 1950s, most of the movies that were shown in Europe were actually Hollywood products. So I just ask you to imagine what an influence these images of American society uh, usually sort of soap operas with a happy ending at the end, and the American film stars, um, uh, what kind of an impact they had on European society and European audiences at the time. So I hope I have made myself clear that there is this almost automatic impact where no institution, no uh, institute of cultural diplomacy also was involved. On the other hand, both the American government, as many other governments, but also the private sector, that is the philanthropic foundations, like the Ford Foundation, began to project themselves into Europe also. And there is the Fulbright Commission as a state-run institution, for example, organizing exchanges. At a zoo station in Berlin, and some of you may have been to Berlin, you have the America House, the America House, which is now, I think, still empty. And not like there's an art exhibition, actually. It's yeah? open. It's okay. Open, yeah. So, you know, there were these America Houses where the Germans in the 1950s could read American newspapers and they, they had lectures also there. And it was the projection of more official American culture into uh, other societies. One of them who was sent over, actually, under the auspices of the American government, was Louis Armstrong. And there is a wonderful book, which I wanted to mention to you, by Penny Van Eschen, an American scholar, who looked at Satchmo and how he was traveling around the world. Of course, you know, it was a very ambiguous enterprise because he was black and he still had segregation and racism in the 50s in this country. And um, Satchmo was actually quite conscious of this, but nevertheless, he decided to go on these tours in Europe and to project this American image of a multi-racial and multi-ethnic society. But he took it with a pinch of salt, and therefore the title of this book is when Th Satchmo went out to blow up the world with his, with his trumpet. So I hope you can see that there was all this activity on a cultural level going on between the governments and especially the American governments and the Europeans, but they also projected themselves into Japan, ultimately also into Africa, Latin America, certainly. You had journals that were published in Spanish and in Portuguese and foreign languages that were paid for partly by the American government and uh, it became quite a scandal when it was found out in the 1960s that the CIA had actually uh, 
subsidize some of these journals. Now, the channel through which this was uh, this uh, projection took place into Europe at the time was the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was a very important sort of umbrella organization that organized all this. But they also got money not only from the State Department, but also from these philanthropic organizations, and especially from uh, the Ford Foundation. So what I would like to emphasize, therefore, is the expansion of cultural diplomacy and culture in this very broad sense um, to the private sector. And I think that is what you also heard on other occasions. It's not just the public sector, the state, that projects itself into other societies, but also the, uh, the uh, private sector. And it's very interesting how, on the one hand, you now had a further uh, expansion of the definition of culture because the Americans also included science in it, the natural sciences. For Euro Europeans, educated Europeans, uh, they thought music and painting and literature, that was high culture. But they included science also and said this is an important aspect of cultural diplomacy and cultural activity in the world. So as a result of this, these private foundations and the private sector now came in and it's very interesting we look at the division of labor that took place. Because on the one hand, there was the Rockefeller Foundation that focused on the social sciences and especially on the sciences and used, for example, now by subsidizing it, Niels Bohr and his Institute for Nuclear Physics in Copenhagen as a turntable where physicists from the West and physicists increasingly after Stalin's death from the East could meet to talk about the dangers of nuclear war. These were people who knew what was going on uh, and how dangerous the arms race was in the 1950s. And they exchanged ideas and said, what can we do, for God's sake, to, uh, to prevent an, a nuclear holocaust? And I would like to argue that the red telephone that you still have in the White House and somewhere in Moscow in Putin's office is actually a result of these, uh, these advisors who said, for God's sake, you have to have a telephone line directly because if a missile goes off accidentally, then at least you can tell the Americans quickly <laughs> that they should uh, rush to their nuclear shelters, which you had actually also in the building next door where the history department is, where you still have a sign that you could hide here in case of a nuclear attack. I mention this also because this has nothing to do with culture, of course. So that's the hard power, if you like, and not the soft power that I've just been talking about. Right? Okay, so uh, the Ford Foundation um, concentrated more on the humanities and the arts, hence the support for the Congress for Cultural Freedom and these magazines that they supported uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, now, I have to rush on, of course, to get through my agenda because so far I've mainly talked about the United States and the public and private sector in the United States. And here, of course, these philanthropies benefited enormously from the tax laws that you have because you can make a donation to a big foundation and you can deduct it from your taxes. Well, many treasuries around the world don't like that kind of system because they lose money because uh, uh, in many European countries you can now deduct a certain amount for charities and donations, but not as much as you can in this country. But this led to the rise of all sorts of big foundations in this country, and you just have to Google them a little bit. Uh, it's amazing how many there are actually religious but also philanthropic organizations in the different. But in the 1960s, the Americans came to the Europeans and especially to the West Germans because they said to them, you've now come into wealth again. There is, has been an economic miracle in uh, Germany in the 1950s 
well, you should now step up to the plate and also have foundations. And they approach a number of very wealthy people, for example, Krupp, but also Thyssen, the Bosch Foundation, uh, and the Volkswagen Foundation. They were all fo founded at that time. And by that time, of course, the Americans had been reassured that it was uh, the, the, their intervention into uh, European politics and economics and culture had been successful, but the Cold War struggle was moving to the Third World. And therefore, they told the Germans and the Brits, etc., well, I think if you want to be active philanthropically, maybe you should look at other continents and commit yourselves there. So, as a result of this, you had suddenly also other foundations becoming active, in this case, not in Europe, during the Cold War struggle in the 1950s, but in other parts of the world. And then there is a peculiar hybrid of a philanthropic foundation, which you may have heard about, because it's peculiar, I think, only to Germany. The Germans have several political parties, like the Social Democrats, and they have a Friedrich Ebert Foundation, um, which is really a political foundation but which gets involved also in civil uh, activities, civic activities. And then um, you have the Adenauer Foundation, Chancellor Adenauer, which is the organization of the Christian Democrats. You have the Naumann Foundation, which is the Liberals, and then the Seidel, which is the Bavarians. Böll, the famous literary uh, person, is uh, the uh, sort of name of the Greens, a Green Party in Germany, and then there's the Luxembourg Foundation, Rosa Luxembourg, the famous uh, socialist communist of who was murdered in 1918, which uh, represents the uh, left party in, in West Germany. So I hope you can see when you look at the spectrum of philanthropic foundations nowadays, they have, of course, on the one hand, still cultural philanthropic purposes in mind, but there has been a politicization of all this also. And the m most uh, significant foundations, as you know, is for example the Shorosh Foundation, um, founded by George Shorosh in this country, which founded the Open Society Foundation, which became very active in the transition to civil societies in Eastern Europe, and then also, more recently, as you probably know, in Moscow, but also in, in, uh, in the Ukraine, to promote democratic grassroots activity among the population. And then, of course, there were other people who became interested in education. Um, Gates, the Gates Foundation, has given a lot of money uh, to philanthropic causes also in Africa, also in this country. Mark Zuckerberg gave, gave 100 million to the school system in New Jersey. The problem is, of course, and that's something to be discussed perhaps, is that you know, there are uh, ambivalences about this kind of philanthropic activity because sometimes you influence things which may turn out wrong. And I think the Gates Foundation had some not very good experiences with their programs in Africa. So I think I want to emphasize that cultural diplomacy, however important it is to create dialogues between people at the same time, of course, does have its problems and we should not just be enthusiastic, say how wonderful it is that we have all this money, but we should also take a critical step back and look at the results of some of these activities. And often the results are not exactly what was originally intended because you sometimes have unintended consequences as you know in politics and everywhere in the world and all of a sudden you have results that certainly were negative and not positive. So let me conclude by uh, saying that of course cultural diplomacy became increasingly important again also in this century and there was a big misunderstanding then that I think the Bush gov government in particular had about 
uh, cultural diplomacy after the Iraq war? Well, as you know, Bush invaded Iraq and it became quite a disaster. And then all of a sudden, uh, first of all, they, uh, people in the State Department said, you know, public diplomacy, um, what did we do in Germany in 1945 when it became clear that Iraq was becoming really chaos and the basket case? And then they had an idea which I think was totally wrong. They employed a Madison Avenue person who said we must have an advertising blitz in the Middle East um, to project the visual media, etc., spending a lot of money on this to the population to show you know, that we are really coming there to bring democracy and so on. It shouldn't be too upset if things go a little bit wrong. And it was a disaster. And the reason for this was, and I mention here, because in the light of this, we had a conference here on diploma, uh, or cultural diplomacy in the 90, uh, after, you know, it must have been in 19, uh, 2005 or so on campus, and we invited not just State Department officials and uh, philanthropies, but also the British Council, the German Academic Exchange Service, all these organizations that you are familiar with, with the question, you know, what is cultural diplomacy and what is the best pr uh, way of projecting uh, your culture into another society? And the result was, of course, that you can't do this with a blitz operation. Uh, cultural diplomacy takes time. It is uh, thick boards which you have to grill because cultural traditions to sort of interact with them are often very deeply rooted in one society and therefore to think that you can change people's ideas about your uh, the, the foreign society or even about your own society, that is really an illusion. So the result of this was that as, a, uh, as you should be very much more cautious when you try to uh, spend a lot of money in a, in a, to project yourself into another society. Final point, what is the future? And here I don't want to destroy too many hopes that you must have as a younger generation, but I think, you know, maybe cultural diplomacy is more necessary today than ever because the world is again in turmoil and in huge conflicts and it is hard power that is being used and not very successfully, I should say, but nevertheless seems to dominate a lot of thinking also in Washington, where you have hawks who you know, try to uh, use military power in order to, uh, to impose particular solutions. And you have this in the context of this debate about the treaty with Iran, because one reason why it was so opposed by many people in this country uh, and who have followed this was because uh, it was felt that you should almost launch a preventive war against Iran now because in 10 years time they would have nuclear weapons and Obama and everybody the State Department had a terrible time trying to convince enough people in Congress ultimately to say no it is more important we sign on the dotted line for this agreement because the hope is that indeed it will be a peaceful res resolution to the conflict rather than uh, another war in the Middle East. So I hope you can see that I'm sometimes a little bit skeptical about whether um, we will succeed by this effort that also the Institute is making because there is a lot of hard work and the chances of getting something done are perhaps uh, not as bright as they were for example, in the 1950s or 1960s, when there was a much greater openness in spite of the Cold War. But maybe the Cold War also promoted this greater willingness to talk to each other, even across the Iron Curtain. And hence, I mentioned the Red Telephone and Niels Bohr and these attempts to restore detente and peace and dialogue rather than a confrontation 
that might ultimately be a nuclear confrontation and blow up the world. Okay, I'll stop here. If you, uh, do we have time uh, for some questions? If, you know, I'll be very happy to uh, have a brief discussion, but there is, I'm, since I'm chairing this, also our next speaker, I read, has he arrived? I think you haven't yeah. seen him. No, yeah, seen well, so okay, in that doing. case, we've got plenty of time. Yes. Yes. Well, let me try to answer these two questions. The first one was, of course, concerned with the spectrum of, you know, uh, cultural interaction and organizing cultural interaction with other societies. And uh, I think I try to emphasize that the public sector, uh, state sector, is, of course, still very important there, except that in recent years, uh, partly because of the cuts in this country, uh, the public sector has suffered many cuts, including the Fulbright Commission. Uh, they no longer offer as many scholarships uh, of exchange as they did in the past, and I think this is a big mistake. Uh, then the private philanthropies that I was talking about, um, well, they are of course still very active, but just as the state sector there are you know, ambiguities also in the way uh, when you look at the results, and I'll talk about this in a moment. So I think uh, foundations should also be very careful in, their, in the way they spend their money, because I think there are quite a few examples which you could mention where the money was badly spent, actually. And then, I think that's why I started with this broad definition of culture. I think you should also look at, well, in the American case, Hollywood or French cinema, how, you know, uh, the mass media also project themselves into other societies. Of course, they want to earn money also by doing this, so it's not completely free uh, and you have to pay for it. Uh, at least uh, for the ads that you that are also put out, but I would argue that the impact, and that also I, I think applies to Russian movies, for example. I th you know uh, always try to imagine since these are mass audiences also, uh, either through television or through uh, through the movie, uh, they are of course constantly um, involved in also the projection of images uh, which are determined of course by your own cultural traditions and perceptions of the world and Hollywood is a good example of this uh, and uh, how they impacted on European society uh, you know when I was young and lived in Germany of course Gone with the Wind was of course a famous blockbuster movie at the time and then we all became interested in Marlon Brando on the waterfront you know and the sort of terrible conditions social criticism 
that, of course, movies also have. It's not just happy endings and soap operas. So I think this is the third area. As to impact or you know effects, well, uh, that's of course very difficult to assess. Um, and uh, historians have wrestled with audience assessment. You know, when you come out of a m movie, you are asked, you know, what did you think? And uh, that is where I think a lot of work still ought to be done, but it's, of course, perceptions are then also influenced again by the uh, domestic responses that foreign imports uh, get. And you coming from Russia, I think, you know, there is a very difficult relationship, as far as I can see at the moment, between uh, the Russian um, projection of itself and position in the world, and especially the American one. Right. Yes, please. And there are several others. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> sorry. Yes, go ahead. Could you speak up a bit more, please? Speak, speak up. Well, first of all, as you know, I'm a historian, and historians are always cowards because you ask them about a problem in the past and they will tell you exactly, you know, this is how it, I think it was. But when you ask them, you know, can you tell me something about the future? Um, I had a colleague who uh, uh, said, well, if you want to learn something about the future, uh, go to the engineering department or political science department and if you want blueprints then go to the engineering department please. So I think it's very difficult to uh, assess what kind of a situation we found ourselves now in in world politics. The only thing I would say here is that American unilateralism of the 1990s has come to an end because we do live in a more multipolar world again, and that raises additional complications. Um, and then, you know, the other problem is, of course, also that uh, uh, you you have uh, uh, the, the popular reaction also to all this and the uh, perceptions that you also have to overcome. And that is why I always feel that programs like this one, so, uh, you know, this is not sort of false advertising, are very important because it is really also up to uh, the next generation. You know, I have lived in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s and gone through all sorts of upheavals, but the challenge, I think, in your generation is, of course, to try to tackle the enormous problems, but in a peaceful way, because when you have military conflict, you have even more chaos, as you can see now in Europe with these huge streams of refugees. What do you do with you know, all the problems that the Europeans face right now? So I think uh, it's, uh, that's why you know, these exchanges are very important. And I came, as you heard, to the United States as a young European student and I then stayed a little longer to do an MA here. And I think it changed my life and my, my perceptions of society. And uh, as you may have noticed, I'm not a Prussian militarist, even though I was born in Berlin. So I hope you can see that you know there is a lot dependent on the dialogues that you develop among yourselves. And that's why I think you know these uh, trips and getting foreign impressions of another society are very important. Perhaps one last question, because 
the next or two can it can we bundle those uh, because our next speaker has arrived and I should say straight away we are actually neighbors uh, in the same apartment at Columbia <laughs> but uh, we only see each other on the corridor so I'm delighted to be able to introduce him in a moment but two questions very briefly perhaps so, yes Well, that's of course a very fine line. And you know, I talked about it a little bit indirectly when I talked about Madison Avenue and George Bush trying to you know, project American um, culture into the Middle East after the Iraqi disaster. Um, and uh, I think it is a dialogue because you don't want to impose things. And the Europeans have been very culpable in this respect, uh, certainly during the age of colonialism and imperialism, because that is when they forcefully projected uh, their civilizing mission, as you know, their civilization onto other societies. And therefore, uh, that's, you know, this fine line, and that is why they so much talk about soft power, because that means, of course, that you have to be much more circumspect and uh, thoughtful about you know what you try to uh, say to another society and what you try to import sorry last question now. yes I'll be brief, quickly. I, I, thank you I, I heard the Australian Prime Minister uh, the former Prime Minister Julie Pillard speak the other day and the question was why this turnover you may be aware of five prime ministerships in the last five years and she said that it's her feeling was that it was the difference the gap between change and the pace of implementing change, that that is slow, and that the pace of media, that the pace of media is so fast and that the public is responding to the pace of media and that these two, in Australia, it manifests mm -hmm. as a, a yeah. leadership change. So I, I wanted to ask about this pace of media, everything we've been saying takes time, relationships yeah. take time, so how do these meet? How yeah. are they gonna meet? Well, you're right, we live in a very fast-paced society and it's become worse I suppose because you all have your cell phones and text and communications is instant uh, but I would like to give another answer to this um, and that is Italy of course has a proportional system of representation I want to look at it uh, in terms of the participation of people in politics now and I think the instabilities that you've had in Italian society are partly res the result of the need whenever you've had election because of the multi-party system in, Ita in Italy to forge coalitions and they're always precarious and fall apart again and then you have, you know, like in Greece also now. Uh, whereas in this country you have a majority electoral system, first past the post. And as a result of this you have only really two parties and uh, they are competing for power right now again, you know, the electoral campaign has already been going on for a year in this country, although we have yet another year to, uh, to go to the polls and ultimately billions of dollars are being spent. And I think this majority system, when you look at the political system and the participation of people in this country now, has actually led to a slowing down of the pace. And, you know, it's become very difficult to agree on anything. And this society, let me assure you, where I live here, is in desperate needs of major infrastructural investments in education. Uh, you've used the subway in, you know, coming up here. You know, billions of dollars have to be invested. And the trouble is that 
there is no consensus over this, and it's, I think, a much more uh, immobile society. And uh, Obama has been trying very hard, but time and again, you know, he's blocked in Congress. So I, you know, my response to your question would be a bit more ambivalent. Therefore, uh, you know, of course, we live in a fast-paced age, but the uh, factors that pull us back, uh, whether they are you know, also religious conservatism, you know, the whole debate about uh, about uh, uh, gay marriage, etc., in this country, there is an enormous pushback by some forces, and that's, I think, uh, when you scratch the surface a little bit, also true of other societies, including the non-European societies where many of you come from. I think I should stop now here and introduce our next speaker. But first, let's express our gratitude to Professor Berkman.